So now that we have Hyper-V installed, configured, and a virtual switch set up, let's take a look at creating a virtual machine. So from the Hyper-V manager, I want to go to over here under actions, go to new, and I can create three different things here, a virtual machine, a hard disk, and a floppy disk. Now, before we get to the virtual machine, I want to talk about something with uh, hard disks. If you go to hard disk, you can pre-create your hard disk that you'll use for your virtual machine, or you can create additional hard disks to be used with your virtual machine. So you'll choose your uh, format, VHD, VHDX, or VHD set. VHDX is probably what you're going to want to use most of the time. VHD set is used for shared virtual disks only. VHD is an older virtual hard disk that only supports disks of up to two terabytes. VHDX will support disks of up to 24 terabytes, and it's much more resilient. So VHDX is probably what you're going to want to use. Now, this is the other key thing here. You can set a thick, you can set the disk type, fixed size, dynamically expanding, or differencing. Now, the reason this is important is because here is the only place where you can create these three different types of virtual hard disks. If you create the virtual hard disk when you create your VM, which it will give you the option to do, and we'll talk about here in a minute, it will create it as dynamically expanding. Now you can read the differences of them here, so let me just summarize real quick. The fixed size takes longer to create, but runs faster. So if you're doing a production virtual machine, this is going to be used in a production environment, people are going to be using it, you probably want to take the time and do a fixed size virtual hard drive. If you are doing a test bed, so something you want to test, try some things out on, using dynamically expanding makes a lot of sense because it creates faster and it doesn't use as much space on your physical hard drive right away. Differencing, you're going to use in a parent-child relationship. And so that's going to be in an environment where you're going to have a bunch of virtual machines and base part of their install is all going to be the same. So let's say you were going to have 10 virtual uh, machines all running like Windows 10 or something like that. They're all going to be very similar. So you could create a parent disk and install the operating system on the parent disk and then create child disk so it would only hold the differences for that virtual machine from the parent disk. So that's a little more challenging. Um, works well it does also introduce more of a single point of failure so that might be something to think about so when you go to do this remember my recommendation most of the time is going to be for a production environment do fixed size and you have to come here to do that and pre-create your vhd because if you create it when you create your vm it'll only be dynamically expanding which doesn't run as well it works fine. It's just not as fast when you are actually running the VM. And there's some technical reasons behind that. Okay, this is also where you'll come if you are going to create an additional virtual hard disk. And let's say you want to add another VHD to an existing VM. This is where you would come to create it. All right, I'm going to bail out of here. And we're going to go back to our new virtual machine. Okay, let's go ahead and click Next. We're going to specify the name for the virtual machine. This is just going to be a demo, so I'm going to call it Demo. If I want to store it in a different location, I will select this. Otherwise, it's going to go with that default location that we talked about when we did the install and we talked about configurations. So if I wanted to go somewhere else, this is where I would specify that. I'm fine with it. So I'm going to specify the generation. Most of the time, you're probably going to want to run Gen 2 as UAF, uh, UEFI based firmware supports 64 bit guest operating systems. The only reason you would use Gen 1 is if you had something that needed some backwards compatibility. So then you might make it Gen 1. Now, once you create the virtual machine, you cannot switch between Gen 1 and Gen 2. Pretty much everything else can be changed, but the generation of the virtual machine is pretty much set. So I'm going to go a Gen 2 virtual machine. All right, how much memory? And this is going to be in gigabytes. So you're going to want to you're going to want to balance a couple of things here. 
especially when you're doing a production environment, if you have multiple virtual machines, you're going to want to think through how much memory do I have on my physical computer and how much do I want to devote to each of these different virtual machines. If I'm going to need four different virtual machines, how much needs to go on machine one, machine two, machine three, machine four, how much do I need to leave for my host operating system? Now we also have the advantage of using dynamic memory. And what that'll do is that will Hyper-V will automatically adjust how much memory is associated with a virtual machine based on how active that machine is. So if you started out with let's say 4096 or 4 gigs of RAM and you enable dynamic virtual memory or dynamic memory and that virtual machine has been sitting quietly and not doing much. Well, if it's not using a lot of memory, Hyper-V will actually take memory away from it so that it can reuse it somewhere else. On the other hand, if it's been very active and it's using a ton of memory, Hyper-V can add additional memory to the virtual machine. Now, this does not work well in a nested virtualization environment. So just something to be aware of. Nested virtualization is where you're running a virtual machine inside a host operating system that is itself a virtual machine inside another host operating system. All right, I'm going to go ahead and set this back down to 1024 for the moment because we're not actually going to do anything. We're just going to walk through the process of configuration. All right, next thing is what are we going to connect it to? Now, this is why we created that virtual switch first. If you forgot to create a virtual switch, it's no big deal. You can just set it as not connected right now, and you can come back later on and reconnect it. If you did create a switch, then you just select the switch that you want it to be tied to. doesn't matter if it's a private switch, public, or external switch, internal switch. doesn't matter. It can. You just select the switch you want it to connect to. Now, you can, by the way, dual home virtual machines by connecting them to more than one uh, virtual switch. That's something we'll talk about probably in our next video. All right, next step is the virtual hard disk. Now, this is where we can create a virtual hard disk. Default is going to be 127 gigabytes. Look at the location. This is the default. If I want to change the location, I can click Browse to change it. I can set the name of it. But it doesn't give me the option to do fixed, dynamically expanding, or differencing. So this is going to default to dynamically expanding. If I created a virtual disk previously, then I'll come down here and say use an existing virtual disk, browse to it, find it, and associate it. Microsoft has also started doing demos where you can get a demo version of their software on a VHD. So you download the VHD and then you'd create a virtual machine and just associate it with that virtual disk and that would bring up that demo. Something else to keep in mind, and this is really interesting, if you delete a virtual machine out of Hyper-V, it will delete the virtual machine file, but it doesn't delete the virtual hard disk by default. So if you deleted a virtual machine because you wanted to free up space, well, that didn't work because you didn't actually free up space. You have to go in and delete the virtual hard drive in order to create more space on your virtual hard disk. But the other thing that's interesting is this gives you sometimes a recovery option. So if you accidentally delete a virtual machine, because that virtual hard drive is still intact, what you would do is you would create a new virtual machine and come down here and say use an existing virtual hard disk and choose that hard disk file. And then it boots back up and your system is kind of restored. So you can also choose to attach a virtual hard disk later. I'm going to go and create a virtual hard disk and click next. And then last option here in this quick uh, insta or this quick creation process is where we're going to install the operating system from. So I can choose to install it later. Don't worry about it, I'll get to it. I can choose to install from a bootable image file. And here what I would do is I would browse to wherever the ISO file was that I wanted to use for the install. And then that's going to preload as a CD drive and it will boot off of that uh, ISO file and install. And then the last option is to install from a network-based server. So that's using a Pixie boot or PXE boot uh, deployment and you'll see that sometimes with WDS. So if I set up WDS Windows Deployment Services and I want it to deploy to this virtual machine uh, from that WDS server I would say install from a network-based installation.
So at the moment I'm going to say I'm going to worry about it later. Click Next and then Finish to create my virtual machine. And once I do, my virtual machine will be created and active here. Now I'll double click to create a connection to my virtual machine, which is currently turned off. That's fine. I can start it. Nothing's majorly going to happen because I haven't associated an, uh, an operating system ISO with it, so it can't install. In fact, if I go to start it, we're going to generate an error here in a minute. But what I wanted to show you here was some of these options here. All right, starting PXE over IPv4, it'll fail in a minute. So this will allow me to send a control alt delete to the uh, system. This will allow me to start the computer as grayed out. This will stop. This will stop. There we go. This sends a shutdown signal to the virtual machine. It doesn't force it to stop. This is the hard turn off. So this will shut down if your operating system supports receiving that shutdown signal. Now, if your operating system is hung or if you don't have an operating system like this one, I can send the shutdown signal and it doesn't really do anything. I have to actually turn off the virtual machine in order to get it to go down. Oops, failed to stop. Now let me try to turn off. Yes, turn it off and down it goes. This, by the way, is your save. And you'll see these change a little bit depending on whether the uh, system is up and running. Now, another thing I want to point out to you right here is the checkpoint. This will allow you to create a checkpoint on that virtual machine. We'll tend to create checkpoints before we make major changes. Now, something to be aware of with checkpoints, and there's a couple of other ways to make them too, like right here. Um, something to be aware of with checkpoints. We tend to create a checkpoint before we make a major change, and then if it doesn't work, we can revert back to the previous good configuration just before we made the checkpoint. But we don't want to leave checkpoints running very long. Personal experience, if you've got a lot of checkpoints on a system, it makes it run slower because now with the way checkpoints work it's having to reference multiple files instead of just one VHD file. It also tends to make the system a little less stable. So don't run a lot of checkpoints. Uh, you can create them, you can after everything works, you know everything works, then delete that checkpoint. And that's going to improve the stability of your system. All right couple of other options here with virtual machines. So we have our virtual machine settings. We'll look at that in another video here in a few minutes. Actions to take on them. But in, so start, shut down, save, pause, checkpoint, revert. This is one that I use quite a bit because it lets me quickly go through and change whatever I have associated with the DVD drive. And that's typically going to be the ISO file. So if I have an ISO file in use and I want to switch to another ISO file, I can do that using the media. The clipboard allows me to copy and paste things back and forth, particularly if I'm running in enhanced mode. Okay, so real quick overview on creating and then working with virtual machines. Now, in the next video, we're going to go a little bit deeper into configuration of the virtual machine after it's been already created.